thanks for braving the cold and being here this morning. Um, I really appreciate that. I know that it is always um, appreciated on the part of our Lord and Savior. Uh, he, uh, I believe he appreciates the intentional investment that we make in him and in his fellowship. We open with a word of prayer. So, Father God, thank you. I mean, I was absolutely overwhelmed at the sunrise this morning. Mm -hmm. The air was still, and it was so crisp and so clear and so beautiful. I don't know if I've ever been able to see from as far as I could see today. It was amazing, Lord, just amazing. And to see the sun coming up over the horse farm and the colors in the cold winter sky, it was just unbelievable just inspiring. So thank you, Lord. Thank you. As we, as scripture teaches us, creation itself speaks volumes of God. And creation itself cries out praise and worship to their creator, God. And today we cry out to you, Jesus, as our savior. So thank you. Uh, thank you uh, for uh, investing in us, Father God. As we gather today, we turn our eyes to you and we ask you, Holy Spirit, to lead us in your teaching. Teach us through our song. Inspire us in our prayers. All in the mighty and matchless name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. We have a lot of this morning is designed around praise and worship. We have a mixture of hymns and songs for us this morning. Less of me and more of you, I think, is the order of the day. So enjoy that today and enjoy the music. Um, again, I invite you to stand as you're able as we worship, and we'll begin with a great um, chorus. We haven't sung this in a little while. I'll play through it, and then we'll sing this chorus together before we lead into our first hymn.
morning, as you can see, it, it revolves around the Lord's Supper. I want to read a couple of scriptures and focus on a couple of scriptures today that focus not just on what we call the ordinance, but on the reasons for the ordinance, the things that the ordinance represents. And I've chosen a couple of scriptures. Of course, the Bible is full of these scriptures. You can hardly go anywhere in scripture and not read of the relationship that the Lord seeks to have with you. To both know and to be known. That's an amazing thing. I say that all the time, but the creator God who seeks to be known by you, he knows how he has created you, and he seeks to be known by you. He wants you to invest in him. I want to start with John 14. Very, very familiar <laughs> scriptures. And you know what I'm, what am I going to say next? One of my favorites. Thank you, Mary. 14, 6, and we know this. I am the way and the truth and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. Okay? We talk about bottom lines of bottom lines. And, and there, there is not a stronger sentence in the Bible that defines us as Christians. For all of the good that we feel in the fellowship, and then all of the narrow-mindedness and judgmentalness that the rest of the world views, that's why. The Lord Jesus Christ says, I am the way and the truth and the life. If you don't believe that, you are not a Christian. It's a defining moment. It's a defining statement into which we must invest. If you had really known me, you would know who my father is. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Again, we talk about the teachings of Jesus Christ, and many non-Christians will say, well, he was a wonderful, wise man and a great prophet. Oh, he was a wonderful, wise man. If you don't believe he is God, then you believe he is a liar, or you believe he's insane for walking around claiming to be God. You can't have everything. If you're walking around as a non-believer believing that your greatest, wisest people are insane or liars, then shame on you. There's a problem there. Jesus does not leave any room, any gray area. It's kind of all or nothing with him. And he makes that very clear. We move to John 15, 4, 14, 15. If you love me, Obey my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate who will never leave you. He is the Holy Spirit who leads into all truth. The world cannot receive him because it isn't looking for him and doesn't recognize him. But you know him, listen, because he lives with you now and later will be in you. No, I will not abandon you as orphans. I will come to you. Soon the world will no longer see me, but you will see me. Since I live, you also will live. When I am raised to life again, you will know that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. Those who accept my commandments and obey them are the ones who love me. And because they love me, my Father will love them, I will love them, and I will reveal myself to them. We celebrate, participate in what we call the ordinances of the church as representations of that investment. In the Churches of God General Conference, and uh, as in many different Protestant denominations that we observe three ordinances. What we call the Lord's Supper, which is often called communion. Uh, the Catholic uh, faith calls it mass. It is when we recognize the act of the Lord on the Last Supper when he used physical representations to demonstrate to his disciples 
and through them to us, thousands of years later, what this relationship looks like. Remember, he talks about following his commands, and one of the rules of it being an ordinance is, is that the Lord Jesus Christ has commanded it. And so we are following what he has asked us to do. And John, we all know as well that Jesus had had enough of religiosity. He had had enough of ritual for the sake of ritual. He had had enough of pomp and circumstance. And so we have to look at this last meal and the intentionality behind it. As they sit and they have the Passover meal. And he spontaneously generates this act of worship and faith. And he takes the bread. There's, there's symbolic representation all over what he's doing here. And, and we could study that for hours. But he takes the elements of the meal and relates them to himself. Knowing full well already that throughout Scripture, Holy Spirit has used this analogy of food over and over and over again from the manna and the bread of life and, and all of the representations of what that means to the animal sacrifices and who gets to eat them afterwards. And all food is not only a huge representation in Scripture, but when we think about it, and I've taught this many times, there really can't be a better representation of this relationship that is spoken of in John 14 than when we eat and then what happens? We are co-joined with the elements of that food. We are co-joined in every cell of our bodies. The nutrition and the, 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 the molecules, if you will, of that food emanate through us. Every fiber of our being is influenced by what we do there. And thus the representation of I am in the Father and you are in me and I am in you. You can't go much deeper than that in terms of representing what that relationship looks like. We often talk about and scripture talks about receiving the Lord's Supper in a worthy manner. And I've talked about my feelings about this as well. That doesn't necessarily mean that non-believers. I believe that an unworthy manner refers to the attitude with which you consume the elements. The heart condition at the time when you receive. Otherwise, we could not teach our children to receive the Lord's Supper. If they're not of age and they haven't made that, but we want that decision, but we want them to see what's going on here. We want them to experience how important it is to us. Well, if, if we had that demand, then we could never teach that. I also believe that we can't speak for the Holy Spirit. And if there's a non-believer right now that is being drawn to this most unique event, and the Holy Spirit is nudging and saying, experience this, experience me, there's nothing like it. Come to the table. Come to the table. Then who am I? Who am I to say, no, not you. You're not worthy. You are. You're not. Do you know who does know who's worthy? Holy Spirit. So I'll leave that between you and him. And all I will do is be the conduit through which it can flow. We look at also the other ordinances. In a couple of weeks, we're going to celebrate baptism. And we see baptism when we talk about the different things of the church. <clears throat> we talk about pre uh, preparing the Lord's Supper. And remember, Jesus teaches, as often as you do this, remember me. And that is the spur. That is the reason why we as Christians will sit and pray before our meals. And not only are we to pray in an attitude of thanksgiving. And not only are we to pray that we actually receive this, but we are to pray in representation and say, yes, Lord, we remember. As I participate, as I partake of this bread and this cup that you have provided, the manna from heaven, the bread of life, I remember your sacrifice. Do this in remembrance of me. 
And so we do this. And some churches do the Lord's Supper or partic- a Catholic. Again, in the Catholic, every time you get together every day, it is available. It is the cornerstone of what you do in worship. In the Protestant faith, we, we bring that out and, and it re- there's huge leeway. There are churches whose doors are open and there is a communion table always set for anybody who would come and come to the table. There are those who participate in this every week, communally, as we are about to do. There are those who set a communion table and have it available every week and an elder of the church available. And there are those who do it quarterly or monthly. Or... And the Lord says that we individually are to do this every time we partake. And we as a fellowship are supposed to be intentional about doing this. Making sure that we do not slack in doing it. Baptism, we talk about one and done, right? How many times can you be reborn? But that is not so with the Lord's Supper. Every time we gather together for a meal, we should be celebrating the Lord's Supper. Every lunch that you have after church, those sorts of things. Every meal you have with your family. Baptism is one and done. How many times could, can you be reborn? That's a valid question. And we say, well, that's just a physical representation, and it charges me up. I know that it's just a physical representation, but there should be a little bit more something behind it. I remember being baptized with Olivia in the Methodist church, and I was sprinkled there. And I feel that I was baptized at that point in time. But as I moved into this role in the churches of God, and I learned of believer's baptism, and I learned of submersion, and I read my scriptures, I wanted baptized. And I had Dr. Mike Walker a couple years ago baptized me in the yellow breeches. I wanted that. I don't know if I was re-baptized, I don't know if I was re-reborn, but if there was a significance behind the doing that physical act again. I wasn't doing it for the sake of ritual, for the sake of church. John also, from John, we derive our uh, ordinance of feet washing, which is unique, not unique. I would say probably half of Protestant denominations recognize that as an ordinance. There's a line in John 13 that says, as I have done this, so you ought to do to one another. And we receive that as a command from the Lord. We should do this. And again, we talk about feet washing and how often we see it one time in Scripture, much like we see the Lord's Supper, and then we don't see much reference to the fact that every time the saints should gather together, we should wash feet. I would like to do it more often. And this is probably one area where I give in to the pressures, so to speak, of the world. I have readopted feet washing once a year. And I feel, that, I feel that I'm okay theologically, scripturally with once a year. But I do give in to that pressure of, um, and it's probably a very wrong thing to do. It's an ordinance of the church and we should do it more often. So those are some of my thoughts as we head into today, into this receiving the Lord's Supper. The key element for today, again, is what we think of it. The only way that you can receive this in an unworthy manner is to receive it in spite of Christ. To receive it as a simple, unemotional, unattached church ritual that you simply have to get through to get out of here. I think that's pretty unworthy. But as we head into prayer today, before we receive the elements, I'd just like you to consider where you are on that scale. As you receive these elements and you you understand the representation that we just read. I am in the Father, he says. The Father is in me and I am in you. And you are in me. We're going to tie that all together. as 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 we eat that bread. The bread of the presence of God within us. And as we understand the act of salvation. We will receive that cup and we will understand the blood of Christ because there can be no forgiveness of sins without the shedding of blood. And he shed his blood. That's the real deal. 
And we understand that and we receive that and we remember. And perhaps we reinvest today. Perhaps we come just to a little bit of a different place with the Lord's Supper today. Perhaps you leave here today and you're reinvigorated to pray at your meals, regardless of who's around you. Amen. And one of the most powerful witnesses that you can have is praying in public. And one of the things that I like to do, and this is kind of my nature, I guess, as an encourager, so to speak, but... And Kelly, you'll see a family gathered and you'll see leading in, the dad leading in prayer or the family in prayer before the meal. And I'll just say, keep up the good work, man. The world needs that. And just keep on walking. We can do it, folks. Amen. We can make a difference. One conversation, one encounter at a time. Father God, we thank you. As we think about the ordinances today, we particularly pay attention to the Lord's Supper. We are open our hearts right now, Father God, and help us, Holy Spirit, to please open our hearts. We open our minds right now for further understanding, for a renewing of the understanding we have of why this happened, why you did this. And we come to you as a submitted people. Praying that we are indeed humbly receiving this in a worthy manner. Because it means something. Because Holy Spirit is speaking to us. Receive me, he says. Receive me. Believer, non-believer alike, come to the table and receive me. Holy Spirit says. Thank you for everything that this means. And in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, we lift this act of worship and obedience to you. Amen. Amen. Would the ushers please prepare to distribute the elements. <laughs>
said that I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Jesus also said, I am the bread of life. And then when he took the night that he was betrayed and he took that bread and he broke it, the disciples, it must have been so profound. And he said, this is my body broken for you. As often as you do this, remember me. And so today we do remember. And I pray that you have inspired us to remember always, dear Lord. Take and eat. Scripture abounds with the teaching of sacrifice. The vast majority of Scripture teaches us and leads up to the sacrifice. We hear the stories of thousands, perhaps millions of animals that were slaughtered for the remission of our sins, but nothing but the blood of Jesus would do. And so when he came and he gave himself up as the perfect human sacrifice. He did it for the remission of your sins. And so when he lifted that cup, that's exactly what he said. This is the blood of the new covenant, not the old animal covenant. This is the blood of the new covenant. This is my blood that is should be shed for the remission of your sins. My blood for your sins. Let that sink in. Do this. Remember me every time you Partake of this cup and drink. While well, you guys. 
guys leave, I would like to say a little prayer. As we often do, we like to pray, don't we? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you so much. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for renewing and, and revitalizing and realigning our vision of your commandments. The ordinances that we share and the commandment, above all, to love one another as I have loved you. We examined that last week. So we follow, Lord. We submit our hearts and we walk with you in us. And that is exactly what this represents. In Jesus' name. Before we go back to the song, I want you now to hear, <coughs> see if you can hear, I've never understood that saying, I guess, see if you can hear, <laughs> exactly what we've been talking about thus far this morning in Romans 8. <clears throat> this is a theological teaching now, beyond the cross, that was given by our brother Paul. <coughs> And it is exactly about the relationship that we have with God through Jesus Christ. And what we just did now, right? The Father is in me. I am in you. And you are in me. Listen to this. And you know this scripture, but listen to it with new ears. What shall we say about such wonderful things as these? If God is for us, who can ever be against us? Since he did not spare even his own son, but gave him up for us all, won't he also give us everything else? Who dares accuse us whom God has chosen for his own? No one. For God himself has given us right standing with himself. That's a righteous relationship. Who then will condemn us? No one. For Christ Jesus died for us, and was raised to life for us, and he is sitting in the place of honor at God's right hand, pleading for us. There's your gospel message for today. Take it with you. Amen. Can anything ever separate us from Christ's love? Does it mean he no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity, or are persecuted or hungry, or destitute, or in danger, or threatened with death? As the scriptures say, for your sake we are killed every day. We are being slaughtered like sheep. No, despite all these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loved us. You hear that? Amen. And I am convinced, and so am I, Brother Paul, I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love, neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither our fears for today or our worries about tomorrow, not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No more than anybody can go in one of your cells and pluck out one of those bread molecules can you be separated from the love of God. Indeed, nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. I just want you to take that with you today and understand why we do what we do and share it. Share it with the world. Every time that you eat, share it with us. There was, I mean, it's just amazing as Marge was playing the music and I see, I saw heads bowed and I saw <coughs> prayers being lifted. And I just saw people just receiving. And I was like, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. So we're going to sing and celebrate now. Again, uh, feel free to stand as you're able. We've got some, some hymns and some choruses and some songs and all kinds of different things. I broke out the guitar this week, trying to give Marge's fingers a little bit of a rest over the holiday season. Uh, she needs a little rehabilitation on them after all of that music. So... Uh, I hope that you can bear with my playing as well. So let's celebrate together. What do we have here? <laughs> oh, yes.
best hymns ever. It's one of my favorites, Marty. <laughs>
those hymns up to life and just pouring yourself out. Uh, I can take a few minutes here and we will come back shortly. Amen.